Good morning, everyone. I am very pleased to be here in Hungary. Um, as Stephanie said, we had a, a, a long two days meeting, um, but the, one of the important decisions that uh, we have taken in these two days that Stephanie didn't mention is that we have elected Stephanie as the other co-chair of the of the INCLO. So uh, that is for us is is was a, a great decision having the Hungarian Civil Liberties uh, Union uh, as a part of the co-chair of this uh, this kind of new creature that INCLO is. It's a, a, it's a global uh, human rights and civil rights organization, but the interesting thing is the members are national human rights and civil rights organization from the north and south. And, and basically, actually, this, uh, this conference is part of the result of joint work that we are doing as an INCLO is uh, in addition also is a strategic support action that we are here in Budapest in, in order to support our partner organization, the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. Uh, and it shows how national organizations around the globe is, can mutually support each other when faced when uh, someone is faced a challenging situation like uh, our partner and sister organization, but also I would say as uh, many other uh, civil society and human rights organizations here in Hungary in the current political uh, context in which Hungarian government and its political party have taken action that in some way cartel the work NGOs are carrying out and and you know, uh, we have been analyzing this situation these two days, and, and we are quite concerned uh, uh, because this we have decided to do this meeting here uh, in 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 Hungary and in Budapest, uh, particularly for my own experience uh, as an Argentinian human rights activist and uh, and in charge of one of the human rights organizations. Uh, in Argentina, the role of the civil society uh, organizations are crucial in order to develop and to promote rule of law and, and human rights into the societies. Uh, some, in some countries in Latin America, we are facing uh, similar challenges like the here in Hungary in terms of trying uh, government trying to uh, stop funding for civil rights and human rights organizations and, and other types. Uh, we were very worried when we talked with uh, our colleagues from the Hungarian Civil Liberties Organization because this hasn't been the only way that the they organization here are facing uh, risk. I mean, uh, there are many other ways. So uh, I think uh, we are here in order to discuss uh, where are the problems are and hopefully uh, try to find a uh, common strategy and particularly for us to learn more in deep the situation here and hopefully as a as a inclo as an international network to to share and and discuss common strategy from how from the international level we can support you uh, and the civil society organizations in Hungary so uh, and in order to to discuss these uh, these issues uh, we have a, a great uh, panel uh, with with me. Uh, in in this panel, we are gonna hear um, Isva, Isvan Rev. Is he good? Pronounce like the word. Um, um, Isvan is a is to, uh, is a professor of history and political science at the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, is the director of the OSS Archivium. He was a founding member in 1984 of the Danube Circle of Envi Environmental Organization and is a past winner of the Right of, Li uh, of Livelihood Award uh, of the Swedish Parliament. 
He has been a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and a research fellow at the Getty Center in Los Angeles and at the Center of Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Science at Stanford. In 1995, he was the recipient of the New European Prize and he is uh, also a member of the Open Society Foundation Global Board. His scholarly interests include history, amnesia, memory, historical anthropology, and documentary traits of the past. So, it's fun. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm here in two capacities. Um, not only as one of the speakers this morning, but uh, in a sense I'm your host. Uh, this is the building of the uh, um, OSA archives, which is probably besides the Hoover Archive at Stanford, um, is the largest uh, archive of uh, the history of the Cold War, and also one of the most important archives of documents related to grave violations of human rights worldwide. Radical populism springs from, thrives on, feeds, and manipulates the inherent distrust in politics. Politics, political life, not just in democratic regimes, have always been looked at with suspicion. Elected representatives already in Athens have been observed, watched, scrutinized, and in case of improper conduct, were removed from office. Even virtue needs limits, wrote Montesquieu. If power is not to be abused, things must be arranged so that power checks power. The framers of the American Constitution aimed at designing a scheme not for good, but for controllable government, constrained both by checks and balances, but also by the continuous, tireless activities of self-organized, active citizens. It seemed for a relatively long moment that universal suffrage, majoritarian rule, as opposed to the rule of the privileged and undeserved minority, would solve the problem of the misuse of power, of public office, that the majority, through its representatives, would be able to prevent moral, political, and economic corruption. Even around 18, 1989, in this part of the world, participants at the round tables that designed not just the transition for communism, but the shape and form of the post-communist world, were convinced that the right electoral rules, combined with detailed rules of the democratic game, would provide sufficient guarantees against the corrupting temptation of public office, of political power, that there was no need for unpredictable watchdog organizations. The democratic process in Parliament would create enough transparency. At that time, ideas about, about the supposed end of history triggered by the experience of the unexpected fall of the communist regimes, were ridiculed, but in fact, we acted as if history had really come to an end, and if there had not been need for experimentation anymore. The democratic oppositions of East and Central Europe, the members of which were gradually embracing liberal ideas by the 1980s, came close to a sort of political theory that the political philosopher Judith Clare termed the liberalism of fear. The memories of 1953, 56, 68, and the introduction of the martial law in Poland in 81, the ever-present possibility of the return, as Judith Clare uh, formulated it, arbitrary, unexpected, unnecessary, and unlicensed acts of force and habitual and pervasive acts of cruelty and torture created the perception that anything, that anything might happen, happen again. And the liberalism of fear, as Judith Clare claimed, is entirely non-utopian. There are no more battles in the 20th century that are not tainted or dubious, claimed the French uh, historian François Furet, 
the author of The End of the French Revolution, a work that announced not only the end of the French Revolution, but the end of revolution as such as well. It is important to keep in mind that the moment of transition in East and Central Europe, the year 1989, coincided with the bicentenary of the French Revolution and the high moment of its revisionist interpretation. This is what we here in this part of the world learned from. Power was seen as inherently unclean, compromising its holder. They, the dissidents, do not want to lead anymore, concluded Václav Havel. The, for François Furet, in his revisionist interpretation of the French Revolution, I quote him, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago has become the basic historical reference for the Soviet experience, ineluctably locating the issue of the Gulag at the very core of the revolutionary endeavor. Today, the Gulag is leading to a rethinking of the terror of the revolution, precisely because of the two undertakings are seen as identical. Jacobinism and Bolshevism are dictatorships of the same kind, he said. Fure and the revisionists took the self-perception of the Bolshevik revolution seriously and turned it inside out. For the Bolsheviks, the revolution was a reenactment of its French predecessor, while for Fure and for the neo tocquevillian revisionists, the French Revolution was not the model and rehearsal of the Bolshevik successor, but instead the seeds of the Bolshevik Revolution had already been sowed in the fall of 1789. The Bolsheviks continued the work of Robespierre. The terror was the womb of the later tragic, inhuman, totalitarian experiments. For Fure, the Bolsheviks did not only represent the revolution as the second coming of the French forerunner, but it originated from the very same roots. Understanding of the Gulag, the history and historiography of the 20th century should start with an understanding of the inscribed genetic program that led from 1789 to the terror. As Stanley Hoffman, the Harvard political scientist, remarked in 1990, I quote him, historians, economists, political analysts now see in the terror not a disastrous detour, but the very essence of the revolution. The new liberalism repudiates the revolution because it sees the radical worm as present in the liberal fruit from the beginning. At the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the question addressed to the revolution became, according to him, whether or not all modern revolutions that took their cue from the French paradigm were similarly tainted, driven along a depressingly well-trodden path from liberation to tyranny. Pierre Chanu, the quantitative historian turned counter-revolutionary evangelist, who would also publish his revisionist book in 1989, compared the French Revolution to the Chinese Cultural Revolution and called it the Chernobyl of French history. Something, and I quote him, dangerously cancerous, and stated that Jacobinism had in its chromosomes the genetic code for Lenin, Stalin, and even for Pol Pot. Representatives during the French Revolution were suspected to turn themselves in Mirabeau's famous formulation into a kind of de facto aristocracy. Patriotic legislators do not speak ill of distrust, Robespierre contended. Whatever you may think, distrust is the guardian of the people's rights. It is to the deep emotion of liberty what jealousy is to love." Unquote. The revolution was obsessed with the need of surveillance, vigilance, denunciation, which Mara practiced in a masterful way, of being constantly alert with the imperative of mistrusting the political elite. The revolution, especially the terror, celebrated the power of surveillance in which everybody could and should participate. This is exactly 
what the members of the anti-communist democratic oppositions and most of the participants in the roundtable discussions emphatically and understandably did not want after long experiences with denunciation and surveillance before 1989. They opted instead for a normally functioning, organized, rule-governed, foreseeable, formalized, institutionalized, guaranteed system. They designed in a meticulous way electoral laws, for example in Hungary, that would in an asymmetrical way lead to disproportionate outcomes, we see the consequences today, disproportionately more seats to the winners and the elimination of small parties that might lead to fragmentation and supposed paralysis. They wanted institutional checks and balances, constitutional courts, supervisory committees, ombudsmen, and we were afraid of uncontrollable, spontaneous initiatives of supervision. They had a trust in the electoral process and its lightly controlled outcomes, balancing the parliament with fundamental laws requiring negotiations among the big parties in order to attain two-thirds supermajority, etc. All this happened at a time when in the more fortunate parts of the world, periodical elections were considered less and less important. When the trust in majoritarian principle became tangibly weakened, when the notion of equal human dignity led to a revised understanding of the rule and the rights of the majority, to the defined understanding uh, a new understanding of the status of minorities. When minority did not mean anymore the small number of privileged and undeserved, but the opposite, the vulnerable, the one in need of protection, the oppressed, those in need of deserved affirmative action. According to the way Pierre Rosan Vallon, the French political philosopher, understands the notion of counter-democracy, these changes and changed perceptions led to a new understanding of the proper working of democracy, according to which democracy means permanent participation in the political process, not only voting periodically at the elections. Democracy is too important to let the politicians run it. The active citizens have to operate it by overseeing, watching, supervising, judging the elected politicians who are const constantly tempted by being corrupted, influenced by particular interest groups, lobbies, financed by special interests. This is how the importance of watchdog organizations, civil liberties unions, human rights organizations, local and global watchdogs emerged grew in number and weight. The traditional understanding of checks and balances became supplemented by watchdog organizations as crucial components of checks and balances of modern liberal democracies. Transparency became the issue of the day, with organizations like Transparency International, Global Witness, Publish What You Pay, the Sunlight Foundations, etc., emerging in Europe and in the US. The mushrooming of such organizations, especially by the help of mining and publishing data on anything and everything by establishing connections and uncovering hidden networks through the internet further delegitimized the already shaken traditional political sphere of democracies. Transparency projects successfully confirmed the worst fears of the citizen and led to the perceived need for even more sunlight, more transparency, more and more substantiated distrust in the course of anti-corruption campaigns that led to more and more corruption scandals that produced the perception that corruption was endless, you just do, don't have all the means to gather all the information, turned the political into a moral discourse. The language of politics turned understandably and unavoidably into the language of moralizing with all its accompanying dangers. Radical populism, including radical right-wing populism that we know from so close here in Hungary, 
hypocritically and in a perverted way has appropriated the language of the revolution and especially how it was used and understood in 1793. Article 3 of the Rights of Man and Citizen stated, the source of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No group, no individual may exercise authority not emanating expressly therefrom. And Article 6 says, law is the expression of the general will. These articles served to legitimize the terror. The cult of indivisibility, the insistence of unity, even on uh, uh, unanimity, was, I think, proclaimed the historian Simon Sh Schema, simultaneously the source of the revolution's greatest rhetorical strengths, and it was also the source of its greatest enduring institutional dilemmas. Indeed, this constitutive aspect of the revolutionary culture is what now makes it so difficult for them to dissolve themselves back into pluralist democracies. Political parties were conceived of as things of darkness, as factions. A loyal opposition was a contradiction in terms. As it was incorporated in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, all power resides in the nation, a rather dangerous prescription. This version offered an intensely concentrated form of sovereignty against which, by definition, there could be no appeal, because one could in no coherent sense appeal against oneself." Unquote. Radical populism insists on the unity of the nation, considers political parties as factions, alien entities in the organic organism of the healthy and unitary national body. The Hungarian version speaks about the people, the Hungarian people, Ozemberek in Hungarian, as the source of all legitimacy and considers parties as inherently subversive, dangerous, and roadblocks in the way of quick and determined decision making. Parliament like, likewise is looked at as a superfluous necessity, an outdated burden on the shoulder of the healthy nation that the leader, out of courtesy, tradition, or because of the foreign will dictated from Brussels, should still for a while tolerate, but something nobody in his right mind would take seriously anymore. The leader rather prefers direct, unmediated consultation with his subjects, with his people. He personally listens their grievances against local elites. Radical populism is anti-elitist, uses a moralizing language, denouncing political corruption, against which it organizes constant campaigns of vigilance. It thrives on artificially created scandals, um, and it is, its main ambition is to deepen distrust in the society. Mistrust in the market, in spontaneous processes, in expertise, in rational arguments, in elites, in the parties, in the parliament, in the political sphere, in politics in general. It would be a mistake not to notice that the language of radical populism, the language radical populism uses to a certain extent resembles to and is in close family relationship with the language used by watchdog organizations. Both are in the business of differently conceived but still similar transparency. Both are fighting corruption. Both use the weapon of denunciation and call for greater vigilance, oversight, and surveillance. Both use a basically moral language, a seemingly similar moralistic approach. It is true, the morale of the civil liberties unions is not the morale of the radical populist. The transparency the watchdog organizations try to achieve is not the sunlight coming from the east that populists are so fond of. 
It is no wonder that the Hungarian government decided to wage a war against the Norwegian Fund, that it tried to denounce the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, that it considers the Open Society Foundations an unwanted alien. Watchdog organizations are considered enemies that try to sabotage the seamless working of the national unity to undermine the so-called national central power space occupied by the nation of true-born Hungarians led by their leader. Still, for the uninitiated, for the less sophisticated or less attentive, the moralizing language of the civil rights groups and transparency organizations aiming for more, more transparency, oversight, and vigilance is dangerously and misleadingly too close to the rhetoric used by cynical populists. The populist tries hard to preempt the sphere of the political. He uses a moralizing language in order to denounce the sphere of politics, the political actors, in order to depoliticize the subjects of the state, to make them politically unprotected, vulnerable, and hopelessly dependent on the centralizing state, where instead of the rule of law, the law of rule prevails. In a radical, depoliticized, anti-political state, there are no properly functioning oppositional parties. Watchdog organizations, civil liberties unions, are forced, in lack of alternative, to take on a political role, which under different circumstances, real political actors routinely fulfill. They have no choice but to play a political role besides their function of observation, oversight, reporting, and investigating. They should be careful when choosing their words. They cannot have the luxury of being mistaken for the populist, to get misidentified as if they were not different from those against whom they should mobilize. In an anti-democratic, illiberal, radical right-wing populist regime, it is not enough to defend individual civil and human rights. Civil groups should, in these exceptional circumstances that could last very long, defend the rights, the political rights of the citizen too. The right of the citizen understood not just as an individual with equal human dignity, but as a member of a real, although momentarily non-existing, political community. As a result of the complete expropriation of the media, the elimination of the independence of the judiciary, there is more need for civil rights and watchdog organizations than under normal circumstances. As these organizations are now central elements of checks and balances, and as traditional checks and balances have been forcefully weakened by the regime, there is greater need than ever for effectively functioning such organizations. The attack against them is evidently political. It is an attack against the basic building blocks of democracy. Civil liberties unions, civil and human rights organizations are not able to fill their most basic functions without taking on the fight in the political realm. There is no way of defending civil and human rights without restoring constitutionalism, without reinstating the independence of the judiciary. There is no possibility for effective protection of civil rights without entering the political sphere. The situation is bleak. There is a high probability that Hungary, the Hungarian government will decide to leave the European Convention on Human Rights, especially after the two latest rulings of the European Court of Human Rights against Hungary. The last ruling, when the court established that the president of the Hungarian Supreme Court had been dismissed because he protested against the curtailing the competencies of the Constitutional Court, is a scandal of such magnitude that under normal circumstances, Tens of thousands of concerned citizens would storm the streets and would not leave until this government disappears. 
we do not live under normal circumstances. This makes it imperative for civil and human rights organizations to rethink their traditional role and not to be afraid to learn from civil rights movements in other parts of the world that had the courage to take, sometime in lack of other actors, to trespass the borderline between the civil and the political spheres. Thank you.